thank you for those who joined us today and hopefully some more people come in. Um, my name is Justin Kissel. I'm the current president of Massa Dearborn and tonight we'll be presenting our electrical preliminary design review. Uh, this is for Project Hazmat, our 2021-22 competition rocket. Um, also known as Operation Hazmat. Uh, the acronym is spelled out below, uh, High Altitude Soil Microorganism Analyzing Test. Uh, this year, we've changed up the format of PDR just a little bit for electrical uh, to try and get more info across in a shorter amount of time. Uh, so please let us know how we did with that and uh, any other changes you'd like to see. Uh, with that said, let's get right into it. Uh, so we'll just, this is just an overview of the presentation. Uh, I'll go over my stuff in the beginning, then we'll get into the meat going over all the subsystems. We'll go over some project management stuff at the end, and then we'll have questions. Uh, here's a team member breakdown. Uh, so this has been updated for all the recruitment that we've done so far this year. Right now we're at 48 members, uh, about 50% more than what we've spent the year with, um, with a breakdown of 32 men and 15 women across all the disciplines shown. Um, Keep in mind that we are still recruiting. We're trying to get, you know, between 50 and 60 right now. Right now we're on the low end of that, uh, but we're trying to get into that range so that next year when we have a lot of people graduate, especially on electrical, uh, then we can have more people to fill their place. Uh, certified flyers, uh, as you know, competition likes us to be certified and we like having the, having the fun of flying more rockets. Uh, so we have some people certified already on the team. Uh, Sierra Stockwell, our former president, is level two. Kyle Johnson, our former power lead, is level two. I am also level two. Uh, Alexander Burkhardt, our recovery lead, and Joshua Hawkins, our electrical lead, are both level one certified. And those rockets are shown to the right. Well, most of them. In addition to this, we are also running a level one certification class led by myself and Sierra, primarily Sierra though. Uh, in addition to the standard L1 build, we're also doing open rocket and CAD tutorials. Uh, and we're gonna launch these in November. Right now we have 23 flyers. So we're planning on getting 23 people certified through Triple E uh, for level one certification on the team. Uh, this includes most, if not all of our airframe and river teams, as well as most of our new members. Here's the team structure. As I said before, I'm the president, Justin Kissel. Um, our mechanical lead is Sarah Dormel. Our electrical lead is Joshua Hawkins. Sierra Stockwell is our interim business lead. And uh, we've not determined a safety and launch operations person, but that will happen closer to the launch. Uh, as for Spaceport America Cup, this is the competition that we compete in every year. It's held out in Las Cruces, New Mexico. The whole goal is to get as close as possible to our target apogee and bring a payload. We run a scientific experiment to that apogee. This year we're competing in the COTS 10K category. So our goal is 10,000 feet using a commercial off the shelf motor. Uh, this means that it's just bought through a vendor. We don't make it ourselves. And then the dates for competition are listed on the third bullet point from the bottom, June 21st through 25th of next year. This was our point breakdown uh, for this last year, 2020, 21. Uh, this was for an online competition through SAC. So it's a bit of a different grading scale, uh, but we did receive an 848.5 points out of a thousand. Uh, this is a roughly a hundred point increase from our previous year. So we're very pleased with that. Uh, and then getting, uh, increasing our placement as well, top 10 in, uh, in the 10K COTS category and then 22nd overall. This is our projected score for uh, this year, this upcoming. Uh, you can see the projected values. We talked about these in the conceptual design review as well. Um, you'll see the plan to make in our technical report as we are starting that early, like we did ag again last year. Uh, and we plan to keep filling that out throughout the year. And we plan to score similarly in design implementation, the progress updates, and we plan to get a bit higher in the flight performance. One big thing that we wanna do that will contribute uh, very nicely to our points are some bonus points for early launch. And we are using the CubeSat load design this year. So we plan to get 50 points for that, which brings us to a total of 940, a very comfortable score out of a thousand. With that 940 points, one of our goals is to place top 15 overall. Um, we assume that this can get us about top five in our competition, but we will see. Um, another goal that we have is to retain 20 new members. As you can see, we've already started Seeing our membership by at least 15, 17 so far. Uh, we want to launch the first day of competition, getting those extra points. And uh, our efforts are actually over uh, our members that we want to get certified. Uh, so we're very happy about that and thinking about running an L2 class at the, uh, in the second semester of this year. This is the vehicle architecture for Hazmat. Uh, so if we start on the far right, we can start on the, bo on the booster, uh, the motor, and then airflow to do this year. 
Uh, the new member payload, which will be discussed a bit here electrically, but mostly in the mechanical. Uh, then we have the booster recovery eBay. This will be the mechanical as well for all the it's the parachute. There's no drogue there because we're seeing reef parachutes in both booster and the dart this year. And then the brake for the dart. Deployable fins and air brakes, similar to last year's rocket. You'll see that there is a motor tube in there. However, there's not a motor labeled. Um, we do plan to launch this rocket to 30,000 feet after competition. Um, for competition, that motor tube is just going to be empty, and we're just going to be designing around it uh, for our air brakes and deployable fins. Uh, the dart parachute is just above that, just above the arm, which houses the air brakes and other avionics. Above that, we have our CubeSat payload, which can be our soil experiment for this year, which we'll go over in a bit. Uh, just below that is our camera shrouds for video that we plan to get this year. And at the very top of the rocket in the nose cone, we have the custom Antella GPS. Here's a comparison between last year's rocket and this year's rocket. Uh, so you see we're changing experiments to the soil microorganism experiment. Uh, it'll be a two-inch design. On are still launching a boosted dart configuration for competition. We're using cubes that on. Uh, to house this CubeSat, we're going to a six diameter instead of five. I plan to launch this rocket to 3,000 feet. Uh, and this year, which we'll talk about in a bit, we are introducing a custom GPS. Uh, this will be a secondary GPS, though, and the LPS will be the primary uh, in competition. This is just a summary of the microorganism experiment. This will be gone on over more in depth on the mechanical side of things. Uh, but the whole idea is to analyze soil health through microorganisms when we're working with the seed board later in the presentation. Uh, we want to compare different types of soil and their health to see if there's some soils that are better, some organisms that are better uh, by monitoring these changes. So for humidity, temperature, CO2, pH, um, and other measurements may be monitored. Some measurements might get, have to get cut depending on how things go. Just a summary of our launch vehicle, which is a bit longer than our previous uh, rocket. Our motor choices are below. This will be going over more in mechanical, but we plan to use an N1100P for 10K launch and an O and an M motor that we already have uh, for the 30. Uh, the recovery system, we plan to use reef parachutes, like I said. This is a safe spacing measure, a, a space saving measure rather, um, to try and keep the length down on the rocket. And uh, we plan to test on our next launch. And this was scheduled in September. It's been moved. We'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, we'll actually talk about it now in our overtime and in our uh, uh, overall timeline breakdown. Um, so you'll see, if you guys can see my mouse there, I think you can. We're right in this section of the timeline in the top right uh, with preliminary design reviews for electrical and mechanical being this week and next. Uh, our launch for Boost to Bear, the next generator, originally planned to be at the end of September. However, due to a motor casing uh, having to be ordered direct from the factory, which added about four to five, and us still not having it, we pushed it back to October, and now we're pushing it back to November 13th, and we hope that that will be the final date. Uh, I've talked to Robert a bit earlier today about confirming that, um, so we hope to launch on that day. The weekend after that, we're going to be launching up at LK Airport for the new member CERT class. Uh, we plan to have a lot of fun with that, and I know our new members are very energized and excited, uh, and we're looking forward to it as well. Uh, we have exams in December, so we're going to take a bit of a week off there uh, for this next rocket in late February to early March. This is the end of spring break, um, which will give us enough time for a full rebuild in case it happens like that. Uh, CBR is in March, uh, then we have our exam season, then the report is due for competition, and then competition itself. Also, right, filling out the SAC uh, progress report number one. Actually, not progress report. It's the uh, the introductory, um, so the actual application to join SAC. So we're doing that right now. That will be submitted by the deadline, so we will be able to be in, uh, so we can get started with the electrical systems. Hi. So I am Joshua Hawkins. Uh, I'll be presenting the electrical overview. I will be going over the team structure, system diagram, timeline in the presentation. Next slide. So here we have the electrical team structure. Up at the top for electrical lead, we have I have myself, Josh Hawkins. From here, we are three sub teams: RF and Power, which are led by Thora, Fadi, and Miguel, respectively. And then below that, we have the uh, general members on each of those teams. 
All the way to the right, we have the current list of new members who we have not currently assigned to a uh, sub team yet. Next slide. Here's the breakdown by members of the projects, sub team that they're in, the new project, and then who is responsible, and then the uh, members who are additionally assigned to that project as well. Next slide. On this one, we have the uh, big overview of what all the systems will look like. Uh, starting on the DART electronics uh, up at the top, we have the uh, PMS Mark III a power that will just uh, send power to all the uh, other systems in the rocket. We also have the transmitter board that will allow for inductive charging, so we could uh, charge the uh, battery from, outside, from outside of the rocket when everything is already in there. Uh, below that, we have the GOAT, which will be this year's version of the air brake controller, and that will uh, operate on the air brakes. Then below that, we have Lapdog, which is a senior design project that is meant to be a reusable flight computer that can perform co the complex algorithm for the air brake calculations and can tr transmit uh, live video and data to ground uh, uh, in, uh, in real time. And then from the Raspberry Pi Zeros, which we use to uh, capture the flight of the rocket or the recording video of the rocket. Then underneath that, we have the seed, which is what we use, which is the board that will uh, monitor the experiment this year. And then directly below that, below that, we have the uh, secondary GPS or the SRED GPS called the PIG. And then also we have a regular primary GPS. On the booster electronics, uh, this is most this is just all for uh, new uh, RRC3, which is a uh, the same ones that are being used for the recovery. However, this is separate from their systems. Uh, we're using this to uh, the RRC3s. They can actually output uh, when things happen in time step. So we record that data if we can, and then also try to make a uh, similar board, which or similar emitter, which is the mock RRC3 board. Uh, just so we can project for emulate what it, what the ultimate alternative do. And then from there we have the uh, booster flight computer, and which will uh, gather all the information and either store it to an SD card or send it to the radio board. And then this will also uh, be in charge of the uh, new member payload experiment. And then as well we have a power board to power each of the new member systems. And then finally we have a, another. Uh, uh, it, I guess for the for the boot would get sent to ground, which will go to something called the dashboard, which is where we will uh, attempt to be able to display live video data. On Next slide. Here's the current budget for all systems. Uh, up on the top, we have all the systems uh, there. All right, that will. We have all of these systems, and with charge and max current draw, and then underneath we have the three kind of main uh, groups of them. We have the payload electronics, which will have an estimated battery of 18 hours. The air brakes, uh, at the worst case, we'll only be able to uh, be powered for hours, but this is with our use, and not the case. And then the uh, SRED GPS, which is just the uh, secondary uh, GPS of the pig, which should last about 20. Here's the overall electrical timeline. Currently, we are in the middle of, and also directly after this, we will start doing stuff. Routing will be directly complete yet, but we'd like to start purchasing our components as soon as possible because the chip shortage is would want to be in stock, would quickly go out of stock. So securing those as soon as possible, great. Next slide. Hey, uh, I'm Fadi, and I'm going to present the GPSs that are on board our rocket. Next. So obviously, the main function of the GPS is to track the rocket until it touches the ground. And we're going to have two on board the rocket, the primary one tell 
Cloud's GPS or a commercial shell being uh, the programmable independent GPS, and it is our custom GPS. Uh, both GPS on the 420 megahertz band, and uh, each GPS independent of each other and of everything else. On our... Next. To transmit data, uh, over to use the encoding PRS. Uh, and I use that, but the Tel GPS is also going to use its own format. Uh, both boards also have the ability to store the data on board. Uh, obviously, their primary being GPS. It is uh, pretty simple. Uh, it's connected to a LiPo battery, and it is transmitting uh, using the antenna. Uh, for Custom GPS. Uh, we have a microcontroller that is hooked up to a battery, which has a to receive data from the GPS and is going to train into next. Hi, I'm a quick software block diagram for the pig. It's just going to be taking in that GPS data, saving it to the SD card, and also sending it to the ground. Um, and the, on the on the ground side, it's going to be reading it out from APRS and the GPS. Um, next slide, please. This is the schematic. Peg. We're currently um, we're a little bit behind schedule just because we had a few last minute changes we had to make. So we're expecting to start our routing literally for PR. Uh, next. we're looking to do. Um, if you notice, that actually the launch for the uh, next generation because GPS on that one. So it's a very good test of the tele GPS for that reason. Uh, the other two tests listed here, long distance testing and battery runtime testing are tests we've done for the tele GPS and other previous tests. So we're just adapting them. The PIG, which is the SRAD GPS. Um, the the long test should be over a mile more than what the 30k is, but we're looking for testing sites for the long distance test because it's very hard to find open ground around here. Um, next slide, please. Hello, my name is Taryn, program of Dashboard. Uh, uh, dashboard is basically allows us to view live data from a web application, and it is currently being developed and being worked on the about fixes and documentation. This is a non-essential uh, uh, because all the system will create temporary testing grounds and the TeleGPS uh, testing grounds software uh, already exists and is being extensively used and tested. And on the right side, you can uh, see the block diagram of the dashboard in which the data is sent via data client to the data server via TCP IP. Uh, the database is uh, used from the SQL and uh, Hawkins again. I'll be going over the Global Operational Air Brake Tuner, or the GO. Next slide. For the purpose of this board, this is meant to use the air brake desired positions on the lap dog. It will uh, and it will also track the current position of the air brakes by use of uh, an internal open loop and and the an additional quadrature code. And this to serve. Serve it a bit as a backup in case the lapdog is not successful. So because of this, it will share a lot of the same, uh, same sensors, which be, some of them are being an IM user, GPS sensor, and Bluetooth. Uh, next slide. Here's the uh, some results or outputs uh, for this board. I'll be outputting the motor position, which uh, one point. Eight degrees, and how the air brake assembly is is this, where a quarter turn will fully open and close the air brakes. There's a range of nine or fifteen positions indexed. It will also uh, send out its own battery voltage, the X Y Z acceleration, and then the pitch yaw and roll. 
well as the uh, GPS coordinates. Uh, these, uh, th this will be sent up, basically just be uh, collected on a round robin schedule over CAN. Uh, one very important thing I need to mention is because of how the air brakes are uh, situated in the rocket, the CAN connection will have to be broken and we are intentionally planning on making it have a weak point so it can be broken during the uh, recovery event. Next slide. Here's the uh, hardware block diagram for the board. I have the uh, IMU and GPS, talk to it over the port. And then I have a controller, and then the kit controller connect uh, over SPY. And then the motor controller obviously uh, deals with the air brakes. Then the CAN controller will connect to the uh, power and CAN connector, trying to make uh, so, uh, somewhat standardized across all the electrical systems. Next slide. Here's the uh, software block diagram. This is kind of a scary diagram, but I can explain it really simply. It'll take uh, incoming CAN and Bluetooth data. It'll process the request, either a sensor request or an air brake request. If it's a sensor request, it'll just gather all the data, gather all the sensors, perform air and pagination, and send it out. If it's an air brake request, it will uh, determine the, check the desired position from where it currently is, then perform a loop to uh, make sure that it gets that exact position, and then we'll send out something saying that it is uh, at the position it needs to be. And just send out, that's it, next slide. The schematic progress, all schematics are currently finished. We're having the uh, uh, microcontroller and the motor controller USB. The USB is uh, something I added on there for additional uh, additional debugging features as well as not having to uh, carry around a power supply when I want to debug the board. So I'd rather just be able to, nice to use a power of USB. Routing is about 80% done. There's only a few more traces and uh, lines that I need to do for it. So it's coming along pretty nicely. This slide. Testing, uh, let's start with the tooth blinky test, which basically is just a, I upload a very basic bare bones version of the Bluetooth software and I try to see if I can find it through like an app on my phone or through my computer. The result that it shows up. Uh, the nice thing about this test is it's just a simple way of knowing that all the hardware works. A battery life testing, we would test it how long the battery will last or battery drain uh, during various uh, settings for currently the uh, motor. And we want to try to see if we can find a uh, setting that lasts up to Currently, we have not found that yet. That is why the uh, current budget uh, reflects it lasting two hours. And then the response, we'd like to see how long it would take from a message being sent from the lapdog to uh, just when the air brakes start actually moving. And we would like this to be under 10 milliseconds so we don't end up uh, having a situation uh, like we had for Boosters Bear the Next Generation, where we had a long daisy chain of uh, lines and boards had to go to, and where it could take uh, uh, like 100 milliseconds or even longer just to actually be able to get there. And by that time, the rockets already moved like 50 feet. Um, next slide. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Miguel Flores, uh, and I'll be presenting the Power Management System Mark III. Next slide. The purpose of the PMS Mark III is to provide battery voltage to other uh, boards within the rocket uh, in which they step down uh, the voltage to the board buck converters. Uh, the PMS Mark III can be charged wired and wirelessly. Uh, the, it's charged wirelessly using the external transmitter board and an onboard receiver board. The PMS distributes power to both lapdog and seed. Next slide, please. So the purpose of the transmitter board is meant to wirelessly charge the payload's batteries using inductive charging. Uh, the transmitter board is external to the rocket and has a uh, copper primary coil. Uh, this pairs to a receiver board internal to the rocket, and that has a secondary copper coil. So the bench power supply external to the rocket delivers alternating current to the transmitter board in which a magnetic field is induced in the primary coil that creates a uh, current in the secondary coil on the receiver board. Next slide. 
System results, uh, the PMS Mark III uh, supplies battery voltage to the other members' boards. Uh, as I've said previously, uh, they have buck converters on their boards and they step down the voltage to their needs. Uh, the PMS will use a 3S2P battery configuration and output 10.8 volts nominal and 8,000 milliamp hour. Uh, and battery voltage and current monitoring is communi communicated across CAN. Uh, Robert, I know you uh, nitpick a lot on our batteries, so we've uh, re-chosen uh, some different batteries from the last review. Uh, these batteries here are capable of 90% discharge at 80 degrees Celsius. Next slide, please. Hardware block diagram, so we can read this from left going to the right. So we have the uh, external power, so our bench power supply, uh, delivering current to the primary coil. Uh, that current uh, is then sent into the secondary coil. Uh, this is through the transmitter board and receiver. And then that goes through the charging IC uh, and USPD is also being fed in here, going to the battery. And then the uh, battery is being sent over to the balancing IC in which that delivers power and then from the right side, we have our temp sensor and accelerometer feeding in inf information to our MCU, and that's being communicated across CAN. Uh, next slide, please. Our software block diagram, pretty simple here. We just have our battery voltage, current monitoring, and temp sensor data uh, being fed into our uh, microcontroller, and that communicates across CAN. Next slide, please. Uh, schematic progress. Uh, our schematics have been completed and routing has begun. Next slide. Testing. Uh, so we have just a few tests here. We're going to be doing a wired test, a wireless charging test, and a battery balancing test. Uh, the wired charging test, uh, we're just uh, expecting uh, the batteries to increase out, or yeah, the partially depleted batteries will increase output voltage uh, post charging. Uh, that, that's expected for both wired and wirelessly charging. Uh, and the battery balancing test, we will start with an unbalanced cell and we expect the unbalanced battery cell to become balanced after balancing. Next slide. Hello, I'm Thora and I'm presenting for the Soil Experiment Electrical Data Board, uh, also known as the Seed Board. Next slide. Uh, so the purpose of the seed board is it's our board for collecting measurements from our soil microorganism experiment, and we want to send that data over the CAN bus to our flight computer. Next slide. Um, so our system results are pretty simple. Uh, we're going to use a Sensirion SCD30 to get uh, CO2 temp and humidity. Um, and it gives us 16 uh, bits of data for that. Um, and the absolute pressure with a Honeywell pressure sensor with 12-bit resolution, 30 PSI, I believe. Um, and both use the I squared C communication protocol. Next slide. Um, for the hardware block diagram, um, it's pretty simple. Uh, you can see our we're getting our data from the CO2 sensor and the um, pressure sensor, and we're sending that to the payload MCU over to CAN, and we're also getting power in, um, from the previous board. Next slide. Software, uh, we're sensing, getting sensor data, reading that data to the MCU, doing some compensation, um, forming a packet with the other data, sending that to CAN. Next slide. Um, so schematic progress uh, on the right is the microcontroller schematic. So that's just our STM32. Uh, uh, schematic are complete and routing has begun. Um, hopefully we'll get that done uh, this month. Next slide. Uh, so two tests are gonna be happening. There's gonna be software testing and hardware testing. So the hardware testing is making sure all the components on the board function properly by this year. Um, I'm gonna check that, you know, with uh, just power and stuff. And uh, software testing will include uh, reading the sensors as well. Next slide.
All right. Uh, my name is Justin Kissel. You heard from me in the beginning and you'll hear from me some more at the end. Um, I'm also the project lead for the senior design project, uh, Project Lapdog. Um, this board is acting as the flight computer for this year's rocket. Um, so it's serving a few different purposes. Uh, one of the purposes is to reduce future software development times. Uh, we're going to create, you know, a lot of libraries and a lot of standardized things that we can use on other boards in the future. Um, not necessarily to decrease the amount of work that other people have to do, but well, actually, yes. Uh, but uh, trying to decrease the hassle of learning a new processor or learning a new system that no one has dealt with before. Um, so there's going to be more resources to have. Uh, um, this board is also going to be in charge of running the air brake control loop. Uh, that's to be sent over to Josh's board um, for actually actuating the, uh, the motor. Uh, we're also going to facilitate the live transmission of video and some other data to the ground. Uh, Matt will talk about our RF chain there. And then any onboard sensors that we have, like temperature, humidity, etc., those will all just go to an SD card on the board. Hello, I'm Matt Cook. I'll be going over some of the hardware and RF stuff on the lapdog. So here is our massive hardware block diagram. You can see in the center of the diagram is the main processor for the board, the Zinc 7010. Uh, up on the top, we're getting in power and CAN, which uh, obviously is how we're ma our main communication source and obviously we need power on the board. Uh, we have an SD card, which we're using to boot off of, as well as locally logged data. Uh, to the right and up above the Zinc, we have some sensors. I'm not gonna go over each of them in detail. Uh, we also have uh, USB connections for uh, debugging the board more easily and hooking up peripherals to it while we're doing development. We also have Ethernet for getting our live video uh, from those Raspberry Pis. Uh, and then we also have uh, our RF stuff all the way down on the bottom. And the short version of that is kind of the top half of that is our transmit chain. We've got a DAC that goes through a filter. And then we've got a nice PLL that generates our carrier frequency and we modulate that. Then we feed that through to a power amplifier and we have a single pole double throw switch that we're using to duplex our antenna so that we can do both transmit and receive. And then on the receive side of things, we've got a low noise amplifier right at the front. Then we push that through to our demodulator, which uses that same PLL from earlier. Then we push that to an analog uh, automatic gain control. And finally we sample it with an ADC in order to get onto the digital processing of the data. You can go to the next slide. So here is the software block diagram for the RF signal processing. So on the left-hand side, we are exchanging data between the ARM processor and the Zinc, as well as a finite state machine controller on the FPGA fabric that's in control of the, uh, of the uh, digital signal processing. Up on top is the transmit chain, pretty simple. We just modulate our data using QAM and we put that through a filter to limit the bandwidth and output that to our DAC. And then on the right, we're getting our data in from the ADC. We have a second automatic gain control step so that uh, we can more finely tune that uh, beyond what we can do on the analog side of things. We push that through a matched filter uh, to that transmit RRC filter we had earlier. And then we have some frequency compensation to take care of any difference in the center frequency on the transmitting and receiving boards. We have timing synchronization to take care of any issues with the any offset on our ADC sampling from uh, our DAC sampling. Then we have a fine magnitude and frequency compensation, which uses a preamble in order to more accurately uh, tune the magnitude, phase, and frequency offsets of the system. And then finally, put that through a QAM demodulator that spits out our original data that we sent from the rocket. And then that gets exchanged back with the arm part of the zinc in order to process it further. I can go to the next slide. Here we have an overview of the front end. So main points is that without any forward error correction, we're looking to get eight to 10 megabits per second of just raw transmit speed. Uh, we're looking to do half duplex. We can transmit and we can receive, but we can't do both at once. We want to do about 27 dBm transmit power, which is bit pretty close to the legal limit that we can do on the 900 megahertz band. So that'll give us a very high range if we're gonna need putting this on a rocket. Uh, we're looking to get around a negative 85 dBm receiver sensitivity without any forward error correction, which uh, based on all the other numbers, gives us up to about five miles of range with no forward error correction or a tracking antenna. But if we include some forward error correction at the cost of a little bit of bandwidth and we include a tracking antenna to try and increase our signal strength, 
we can hit up to about 30 miles tops. You can go on the next slide. All right, so I'm Lucas Rins, and I'm going to talk about the software architecture for the lapdog really quick. Um, so as you can see in this diagram, there's going to be several uh, blocks of different blocks, and those blocks are what we're going to be considered as separate libraries in this project. So each of these libraries are going to be what consists of the main architecture for our software. Um, starting at the top uh, left, we can see the TCP blocks that has the TCP server and client handler, as well as the CAN bus interface and CAN IO handler. Those are going to be the main IO interfaces for the lapdog, since we're primarily planning on using uh, CAN interface to external boards as well as Ethernet. These boards, both of those modules will have a uh, item called a packet buffer, which is going to be how we're going to store the uh, raw incoming data stream. The packet buffer holds just the amount of data and then some descriptions about where it came from and just the data size. Both of those I.O. devices um, will be running on their own threads in a separate system and will be done polling based. So you can have multiple CAN buses pulling from one thread and then multiple clients on the TCP pulling from one thread to keep it so we don't have too many threads running on the same thing and we can take advantage of the cores and the zinc. All of these will interface with the messaging system. All the messages transmitted between CAN and Ethernet will be a message-based system. A message will consist of one or multiple variables or states of a board and the messages will be logically grouped together. The messages will be decoded from the raw data and sent forward onto the publisher. The publisher is the main body of our publisher subscriber model, which is what we're using to transmit data to the necessary applications on the board. The subscribers will uh, subscribe to a specific message and will give that message available to whatever application they're running regardless, and they have to have no information about the further design, just what message exists, which uh, allows for better separation between the logical blocks and allows for more ease of integration. Um, the applications we have is the file IO handler, which is going to handle all the data logging. Each message will be logged as well as any video messages as well. Um, and then we also have the airbrake control section. That will be the mostly auto-generated code from MATLAB for our airbrake control system. And it will have some additional interfacing for using subscribers and getting output data. Additionally, that will also output data directly to the publisher, which will then resend the data to an IO device to communicate with Josh's board. Next slide. So all of the software will be written in C and C++. Most of the main uh, blocks of software will be done in C++ as it allows for more of an object oriented approach. However, the messaging system is going to be done primarily in C to allow for integration with the other boards that would be implementing messages as well. So that way we can guarantee they will compile on any board. The software will be running on an embedded, embedded Linux kernel, which we're going to be creating using Peta Linux. Um, as I said before, all the software will be broken into logical groupings. This is to ease the development as well as separating it logically so we only use what we need in an application and we can tailor it or change it in the future, make the architecture more modular. And as I said, we'll be able to use the libraries on external boards whenever needed to simplify the software development process and speed along any future projects. Next slide. All right, and as far as schematics, uh, we use Altium just like everyone else. Um, and more than 90% of our schematics are complete. Uh, you can see to the right, this is the schematic of one of our DDR3 RAM chips. We have two on the board um, and we're ready to move to board routing. Uh, we've already started it just a bit, just placing components roughly. Uh, this board will be very dense, but it will be able to fit in the form factor that we have. Uh, as for testing, we have a few tests planned. I imagine that there will be more that come up as we go. Uh, the first test that we'll have run into will just be power on. Uh, after soldering, we want to make sure that everything is detected on the board and that we have nominal function throughout the board. That we hope to be done by November. Uh, this board's on a bit of an increased timeline due to the fact that it is a senior design project, uh, but we believe that we can hold the both timelines uh, in, a, in a decent fashion. After this, we also have to do peripheral testing. Uh, so we're just gonna probe all the connections and different devices on the board. And uh, I say ping here, it's fairly simple, um, but uh, we're just gonna send commands that those different peripherals would recognize and see if they respond correctly. Uh, and then on the bottom, we have RF loopback testing. Uh, this will be where Matt uh, tries to, uh, or make sure that his RF loop is working on both the hardware and the software side. And that we expect to be done by early next year. Kyle? Oh, sorry, guys. I, uh, I was talking. My mic was muted. 
Um, hello, I'm Kyle Johnson, and I'm going to be presenting the new member payload electronics slides along with uh, Andrea, Andrea Maldonado and Sam Medallo. Uh, so go ahead. Hi, I'm Andrea, and the new member payload objectives include creating a simple flight computer, making a power board, making a radio board, having new members see a design through to completion, and having new members produce a fun payload experiment, which is challenging and interesting. Next slide. So the thing with the payload this year is that, uh, well, for the new member payload at least, right now we don't know exactly what we're doing. We're still in the new member training, uh, initial design training phase. Uh, and I'll go over that when we get to the timeline. <clears throat> but we are on schedule and uh, we're gonna have a payload decided on soon. All right, I'm Sam Adalio, and over here we have our block diagram for the electrical systems in the new member payload. So starting from the top, we have our power board, which is gonna be delivering power to all of the boards in the, um, in the new member payload section. And so it will be, and then we have our flight computer, which will be monitoring the experiment board, which will be collecting data from the experiment in the new member payload. And to the right, we have our mock altimeter, which will be trying to um, getting approximately close and see like um, the altitude, like simula simulating the RRC3 altimeter, see if we can get close enough to the actual altitude. And at the bottom, we have the RRC3 altimeter, which will be used as our primary um, altimeter to measure our al current altitude of the rocket. And then over to the left, we have the radio board, which will be transmitting data to the ground. Next slide, please. So here's the timeline. Uh, as you can see, we are still in that initial design training phase, and that goes on until the 22nd, after which we're going to do design iteration one. Hopefully we'll be able to knock that all out pretty fast uh, before the internal new member design review. And then we're going to keep on des designing. I guess design iteration one is probably just going to be schematics. Design iteration two can be layout. Uh, manufacturing season, once we get the boards printed, and then we're going to do a bit of a test launch. Uh, we're going to learn from that test launch and do design iteration three. And then we can start manufacturing again uh, for the real launch in June. Let's go ahead. And then uh, for the testing, uh, since we haven't decided on a payload quite yet, uh, I left some of it very general, uh, just expected result to be decided for the undecided payload experiment. Uh, but besides that, we're just going to have some general functionality tests for power. So we're going to be checking the voltage, uh, the voltage rails from the butt converters. Uh, we're going to see if we can get an RF link. And then we're also going to be checking to see if we can communicate with the microcontroller, of course, just uh, everything that would be needed for our actual payload we're going to be doing on this new member payload. Go ahead. Sorry about that. I'm uh, Joshua Hawkins. I'm here to present the electrical risk analysis. Next slide. Uh, starting for, with the lapdog. Uh, the main risk we have is manufacturing, failure to solder the zinc chip. The zinc chip is a 400 pin BGA with, I believe, a 0.8 millimeter pitch. Uh, we've been relatively successful, or Matt, I should say, has been relatively successful when it comes to soldering BGA chips. However, uh, the highest one he's had to do is 225, and this one's 400. So there's definitely a real possibility that we could, uh, or something could go wrong there. This is a relatively low probability, as I've mentioned, because we've been relatively successful when it comes to soldering them. However, if it doesn't work, the entire system uh, or most of the electronic systems fail. Uh, the, I should point out that the severity in this case is referring to the electrical systems and not the uh, flight. And our mitigation plan is to uh, make sure we buy extra chips and practice and we make sure we practice. Uh, we have had a uh, um, we have had a, we do have a, a BGA test board. We've had a couple members practice on as well. Next slide. Uh, here's the uh, PMS Mark III risk analysis. Uh, it, we could have the potential failure of the battery dies. And if this happens, uh, nothing will end up getting powered. We should have a relatively low uh, probability due to the battery life and just making sure everything's secured. Uh, but this will have a, uh, a severity of three uh, just because nothing will really end up working. Uh, and then there's the uh, issue of batteries exploding due to heat, and this will result in the same thing, just nothing will have any, will output any power. 
and there could be the potential risk for fire or uh, damage to the uh, structure of the pay, a uh, small damage to the structure of the payload or the uh, mounts of holding the battery. Um, but this should have a very, very low probability. As we, as we have mentioned, we have uh, specifically sought out to find batteries that will uh, be able to survive in higher temperatures. They are able to survive like nine, they are able to output 90% uh, current at 80 degrees Celsius. And one of the tests that they do is they keep them in a uh, warehouse at 60 degrees Celsius for several months to make sure that they are, and test them at the end to see if there's any, it, they test them at the end there's very minimal uh, degradation of performance. However, if this doesn't work, it will, none of the boards will get powered, which will be a big problem for the electrical systems. And there may be small damage to the uh, battery. Next slide. Here's the uh, flight risk analysis. These are uh, some of the systems that may have a uh, more realistic chance of uh, affecting flight. Next slide. Here's the uh, GPS tracking risk analysis. Uh, if they, we start with the simple one of the GPS just not being powered, uh, the tele GPS not being powered, the potential failure mode is that we just do not recover the rocket. This is a relatively low probability, but uh, has a uh, high impact because we don't recover the rocket. That's very bad news for us in the competition. Um, our main mitigation is just to test the battery and make sure everything is secured. Um, the other issue is that the uh, rocket floats too far away and there could be a potential that the uh, tele-GPS just loses range, which was on the same issue of we won't be able to recover the rocket which is very bad news. And we just have to rigorously test distance to know how far we can go and testing link budget. Um, the next one is that the uh, tele-GPS data is not being received. So while the tele-GPS would still be working, the sources or methods we have to actually acquire that information would not work. And this could still uh, potentially have the issue of losing the rocket, which again is not very good. Um, our main uh, mitigation plan for this is having a backup ground station, making sure that still works with uh, APRS code, uh, APRS with MCC. Next slide. Uh, here's some more uh, GPS tracking risks. This is for the uh, SRED GPS or the PIG or the secondary. Um, we have, uh, the, there's potential that it does not work. Um, basically, this means that this the board just not be able to track the rocket, which is a definitely a possibility. However, it's not really that big of an issue if it doesn't, because this is a secondary or more so a test. But we would like it to work regardless. The mitigation plan will just be having sense of battery testing. Then we have the same issue of just uh, it's too far away; they won't won't be able to track the rocket after some distance which isn't too bad as if it's the secondary GPS. Um, and we just have to make sure we have to uh, test the distance and link budget. And then finally, uh, we aren't able to, for some reason, to be able to receive that route, that information. And it's same issue, which is not being able to track the rocket. And the mitigation plan for this is having backup uh, ground station code with APRS with MCC. Uh, next slide. Here's the uh, GOAT uh, risk analysis. We have the issue of the air, the battery dies. Uh, the air brakes do not function, which uh, this will have a probability of two, this very six. Uh, the thing that we've included this year, at least on the mechanical side, is that now there's a torsion spring holding the air brakes together. So in the case of the uh, air brakes uh, the not being powered, there won't be uh, only friction holding the air brakes together. So now there's actually a spring holding things together. Uh, the mitigation plan would just be to uh, create a wake up function or of some sorts that will wake up when the rocket is launching. This will preserve uh, power because the air brakes don't need to be actively powered when they're on the ground pad. And they only need to be powered when we're actually trying to use them uh, you know, near the end of uh, flight before Apogee. Uh, the other issue that we have would be skipping steps. Uh, this would basically would be, I tell the air, the air brakes to move a certain position, but due to issues with friction or some other reason, uh, the air brakes don't actually move the amount of steps that we say. And so this would mean that we would 
the internal open loop tracking would not match reality. Uh, and our mitigation plan for this would be to uh, monitor with an external encoder and compare the values to make sure that everything lines up. Next slide. Here's the uh, lapdog risk analysis. Uh, we have the potential failure of software just not working in the error break control loop. And basically, it just means that it's going sporadically and it's not giving us the stable output that we'd like. And this could result in uh, sporadic air brake movement, which we would not very much want at all. And this could have a low, it's a very low probability, but it could potentially have a big uh, impact on the flight. Uh, the mitigation plan is just to test physical logical limits for the air brake movement and just make sure that everything that we're outputting uh, makes logical sense. Next slide. All right, and we will move on to the project management side of things. So uh, Sierra and I have some things to do before we wrap up, but we are almost to the end. Um, I'll go over some design completion things. Sierra will go over our financials and then we'll open up for questions. Uh, so for the electrical design completion, uh, we can see a list of all the projects here um, as they were presented in the presentation. And we can see the hours left to completion as well as the percentage completion of them right now. Uh, you'll see we have a couple systems very close to completion and the rest are around the 50% mark. The Tele GPS is done with design because it is a COTS GPS. Uh, all that we have to do for it is we do a lot of testing uh, as we've stated in previous design reviews and today. And we do some software things on our end for it, but nothing in design. The other boards are coming along well uh, with schematics being done for almost every board and routing should be done by the end of the month for everything. And then we can start moving into manufacturing, uh, but we're estimating about 175 hours left uh, over the rest of October uh, for us to complete design. So we're looking pretty good there. Hello, I'm Sierra Stockwell and I'll be going over our financials today. We're going to start with a budget overview, then we'll go through justification, funding sources, and sponsors. So here's our budget overview. As you can see, our budget has increased quite a bit, but in the electrical side, it has almost in all categories decreased significantly compared to our last uh, budget that was pitched to the university. So other than the electrical general um, amount, all of electrical has decreased and we mainly have increases due to administrative and airframe costs, which I will talk more about in the next slide. Oh, but our major, our entire budget this year is projected to be $56,991.47. Our justification for this large increase is that we are planning to bring 40 members to competition instead of the previous 20. Housing and gas price has increased. We are planning to do a 30K launch in Kansas after competition, which means we need to purchase more motors that are also larger and we will have more travel costs. Bringing 40 members to competition and you know, the increase in housing and gas prices has increased the budget for Airbnbs and gas significantly, which is why our admin budget has increased so much. And we also have our new member certification class, which we previously expected to have at least mostly covered through funding that was granted a few years ago, but that uh, fund uh, fell through, so we have raised new sponsorship in place of that to um, still have that new member certification class. Next. Here are funding sources for the year. As you can see, we have basically already secured the amount that we need for the year. Um, from CCS, we requested $30,000. We expect to get that amount since we have received that amount in previous years and we have continued to do well in competition and we received twenty thousand dollars from the woods foundation five thousand dollars from ford motor company we are going to receive two thousand dollars from magna international and we expect to receive three thousand dollars from giving blue day but even without that three thousand dollars from giving blue day we are still uh, above our budgeted amount 
for a total of $60,000, including Giving Blue Day. And we plan to reach out to more sponsors in the future to add on things like an L2 certification class in the next semester and that sort of thing that the team would like to expand on. We'd like to give a major thank you to our sponsors, SolidWorks, the College of Engineering and Computer Science at University of Michigan Dearborn, the Woods Foundation, Cutall, Ford, the Rousey family, and Magna. All right, so thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, the presentation part of the design review is now complete uh, right at seven o'clock too. So we made great time today. Um, I'm going to put another link to the electrical rubric form in the chat here once I pull it up, but uh, everyone should have received it on email as well uh, with the presentation. Um, but we're going to go down the guest list for questions uh, and then I won't forget to plug our YouTube channel. Um, if you're not subscribed, feel free to subscribe. Uh, it's Massa Dearborn Rocketry on YouTube. Um, we upload design reviews, other tutorials for our members, and we also upload our launches on there as well. We have all of our certification launches, and we're going to put some other launches up there soon. Um, but yeah, so I'll switch over and I'll uh, I'll open up the chat here, and then we can go down the list for people to ask questions. Uh, but let's take a look here. Who's first on our list? Okay, Michael Kirkhart. Uh, I know you've been asking questions throughout. Uh, did you have anything else you'd like to ask? Oh gosh. Well, you're probably gonna have to limit my time here. Uh, otherwise, I'll, I'll I'll take up the whole time. But um, one of the first things is there was no mention of antennas. Um, what's the plan on that? Especially for the uh, the main uh, what, what were you guys calling it? Lap dog. Yeah, that's for lap dog. Uh, Matt, did you want to answer that one? Sure. So right now. Uh, depending on which one you're talking about, things are just kind of pretty standard or things are a little bit undecided still. So on stuff like the GPSs, those are just standard antennas, just like commercial dipoles or wire antennas, nothing new there. And on Lapdog, we are not entirely sure about uh, how we're going to handle that yet because of the fact that we're doing the CubeSat uh, uh, form factor. So that kind of limits uh, how we can package things. So we're still working that out. And that was something that we were going to be looking a little bit more into uh, in the next few weeks after we launched this last rocket, because it's been taking up a little bit more of our time than uh, I would like, at least personally. So I haven't had a chance to look into that too deeply yet, but it's on the roster as one of the next things I have to deal with. OK. Um... On, on the lap dog, is there any reason that you're adding a receiver? Is this or is this just because you guys um, th this is sort of like functioning dual use? I assume this is like part of your part of your senior pro uh, somebody's senior project. But anyway, uh, I was just kind of curious as to what 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 the plan is for the receive on this. Sure. So the plan there is kind of twofold. So one is that uh, it kind it helps. Well, in some ways, it helps simplify things because we can just use the same board on both the ground side and on the rocket side for transmitting and receiving. And it also allows us to uh, do uh, any like error correction that doesn't, that we can't do like simplex, such as acknowledgements and things like that. And then, sec and then lastly, it's just useful for being able to do uh, kind of test, well, I shouldn't say testing, but it's useful for verification reasons where we can actually send data back and forth to the rocket while we're on the pad and in situations like that in order to just make sure everything is all right. Hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I must, I must have missed the slides on the ground station part, but uh, yeah, that makes perfect sense if you can, if you can use the same design to function as your ground station receive. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't know if we ever explicitly mentioned that, but that was the plan. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So that that makes sense. Um, I I didn't see the link budget for the uh, for the, uh, the the uh, the the uh, the transmit or the you know the link out for the slap dog. Yeah, right here. I've I got what like, I've just got like the high level. Like this is the this yes. these are like the results I pulled from it. If you'd like the details, I can pull them from for you later. But this is uh, pretty much identical to the one that we had this last year because we're using a lot of the same stuff. Uh, that we that we were doing this last year on the modulation side and on the uh, transmitter side, so there's not a huge change there. Okay, so so last year's link budget 
would pretty much be apl applicable yeah. to this. Yeah. Okay. 80 minus 85 dBm uh, sensitivity. Is that is that actually doable? Yes. Is it, so that's what you're getting on last year's board. Yeah. So that's that's basically our limit. So like that, of course, is like is uh, or sorry, I was going to say something about fade margin that wasn't actually relevant. But yes, that is about where we're looking to get based on both the theoretical math as well as MATLAB simulations of the entire signal chain. Okay. Well, of course, you, you for on the receive side, you have like a, a separate LNA, and that's probably going to drive most of that sensitivity. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Where else? I got all kinds of notes written down here. All right, wind budgets. I got that. Um, as far as the, the software stuff you guys are doing on that pub sub stuff you guys are doing, you, you're planning on doing that yourself, home rolling that, or are you going to use something like Ross? Um, for right now, we're have a we have a basic working one uh, done. We don't need super fancy features, so it's just a uh, standard one that I wrote. I've been doing a lot of testing on it so far, and everything appears to be working pretty well. Okay, I, I was just curious about that. When I saw that, I'm like, oh, are you guys trying to write this yourself? Or are you guys <laughs> yeah, I, I thought about using Ross originally, but I decided um, for ease of implementation, I was going to write a simple one. But in the future, oh. uh, with stretch goals, I might integrate stuff into Ross. Well, I mean, I mean, if if what you got there works, that that's fine. It's just like mm -hmm. you know, doing these kind of thing, you know, inter process communication stuff is always a little trickier than it, it seems. <laughs> yeah, at first. Mm -hmm. it's but deceiving. I, I know, but uh, Ross may come with a lot, a lot of baggage. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Any other questions I had? Oh, as as far as all, there's a couple of boards that have like IMUs, and I'm assuming these are just like single chip combo three three D uh, Excel yep. and gyros and all that. Yep. Yep. That's exactly what it is. Okay. Um, has anybody looked into what it, I mean, depending on what you're trying to do, if you're just trying to get like simple sensor readings, that's one thing, but if you're trying to actually do inertial mat navigation, um, that's a lot, I, I just caution you guys, it's a lot trickier than you might think. And I don't know if any, if you've thought about things about, you know, cause I, I can tell you from, from experience, those sensors drift horribly, especially the gyros. There are always you, you. You've got to keep them under constant calibration. You know, yeah, basically, basically the biases. We're, we're pretty well aware of those problems. Ideally, if things go well with software, we'll probably look into doing Kalman filtering, and I should be able to help out with that since I'm actually in a stochastic processes class right now. We're dealing with Markov chains, which is exactly what a Kalman filter is. So I should be pretty well equipped to handle dealing with that uh, when the yeah. time comes. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you know, and the trick is if you're using a Kalman filter, you know, there's a couple there's a couple choices you have. Whether yeah, it's I know. Like there's a, like there's the unscented one. There's one other. There's a standard one. Well, there's well, yeah. That aside from that, there's like the standard, that, but that assumes linear. You know, uh, part of yeah. the problem, the thing with the Kalman filter is it assumes linear. You know, linear time invariant system, and it assumes all your unmodeled system errors errors are like zero mean. You know, you know with you know zero mean Gaussian. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times that's not the case. Um, so if you have nonlinearities, that's where you have to typically use things like extended Kalman filters. But I was talking about there's two different ways to process data through a Kalman filter when it's related to navigation. There's what they call the total state filter, where you just ram all the sensor data through it. Um, and then there's also the, the error model, where you, you use the Kalman filter just basically to estimate errors rather than to estimate total state, meaning like your position, velocity, and all that kind of stuff. Sometimes doing the error, the error model is simpler because you can actually linearize it, um, and it doesn't have to be, you know, it doesn't have to be run at high rates. You know, the thing I'd be careful about is if this, if that's, if you have a large common filter and you try to want to run it at high update rates, it's gonna, it's gonna chew up a lot of your CPU. Mm -hmm. And then the big thing is having proper error, you know, noise models for all your sensors. That's where things get tricky. But. Yeah, thankfully, we are the sensors that we're using are pretty common ones, so I'd be surprised if we couldn't find already made models for them. That would be nice, um, but I wouldn't count on it. Um, you know, it's unfortunate. I don't know who's, who's, who's teaching in stochastic process. Uh, I have Kim Hyogen for that. Okay, yeah, that's somebody I don't know. 
um, you know, back when I was there in grad school, um, I had Professor Beck for for uh, modern control theory. I, I understand he's no longer there, but he would have been the guy I would have had you sent you to on, on the Kalman filter stuff. Yeah. The other thing is, I am pretty good friends with, with Professor Dabkowski, who I have talked about this before, and I remember him saying he has experience working with Kalman filtering. Oh, as good. Well. Good. Yes. By all means, talk to him. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to, that, that's the brunt of my questions. If I can think of anything else, I can send email it or chat it, but I don't want to sure. probably taking up way too much time. No, you're all, you're okay. We can always loop back around as well. Okay. I, I yield the floor. <laughs> all right. Uh, Professor Putty, you're up next. Um, I don't really have any questions for you guys. Um, the main reason I was here today was to, you know, I'm your senior design advisor and wanted to learn a little bit more about that system um, and how it fits into the overall picture. You know, I've asked you my questions before and, and you, you guys were able to answer them. And um, I, I think, you know, a number of others during this presentation have asked similar questions. So I, I, I'm, I'm good for today. I don't really have any questions for you at this point. Um, all right. Well, thank you for coming. Um, you're, I hope that you uh, you uh, have a better understanding of how the system works with our board now. Right, I do, and um, it's uh, it's it's like I like you guys know it's a great senior design project. So, all right. Well, thank you. I see Rob. You're already unmuted. I am ready. What you got for us today? I can't hear you if you're talking, Rob. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, the only the only question I had, and I don't know the answer to it, but you talked about keeping your batteries cool before you use them. Is that a good plan? When you're, isn't that increasing the chance of shocking them when you go from cool to 120 degrees in a rocket? I believe that the uh, the idea that we're going with for now. Uh, is that we're going to keep them, you know, at about room temperature. Uh, we're going to try and think of ways, uh, you know, we're tossing around the idea for like a sweater for the rocket and keeping it under a tent, uh -huh. you know, keeping it out of the sun. Uh, and I think that'll be enough. I don't think any active cooling will be uh, necessary. Okay, you know, that was my concern because, yep. okay, and that's all I had. I thought it was a good presentation. All right. Thank you so much. All right, and after that, we can loop around. Uh, Dr. Ratz, I know you just joined, but uh, we're happy to have you. If you have any specific questions, uh, feel free to let us know. Uh, no questions at this time. Thank you. Of course. Uh, yeah, we were uh, going through everything pretty quick today. Uh, any other questions? I'll just open the floor to everybody now. Um, any other questions that anyone has? We're able to answer them, even anyone on the team. Uh, if you're not on electrical, feel free to ask a question, and we've got an answer for you. Oh, you guys left it quiet, so you know what oh, that no. means. All right, what <laughs> you got? I was expecting this. <laughs> of course. No, this is all good. Um, um, I thought about this a little bit as far as you've got um, two different radios that or uh, I think it's the... Um, the uh, the the one COTS uh, tracking GPS, um, yeah, the, the the tele GPS, and as well as your guys' little programmable independent GPS are both transmitting APRS. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, as an alternative, I don't know if you guys were planning on like developing your own APRS ground station, but I, but because it's such a popular thing, uh, you could probably find. You know, an open source, an open source APRS uh, ground state, open source APS, APRS ground station software that you might be able to use. Is this a suggestion? I know that I was at least thinking about it, but the the problem is that we were thinking about integrating other stuff into the dashboard as well. That's kind of the big thing about it. It's supposed to have more than just the GPS coordinates. Uh, if we if we need a system just for the GPS coordinates, I agree that that would be a. a a, probably a better solution. Um, doing all the radio, all the GPS is running APRS is something that we're kind of playing because competition wants us to. So um, mm -hmm. 
before we weren't considering as an option, but yeah, that would definitely be an option if if uh, if the dashboard fails, which the dashboard's a non-critical um, system, so if we have to cut it, we'll end up cutting it. Okay, that, that may, what you said makes sense. Um, and you know, parsing parsing the APRS that you know comes out from on the receive side is probably not horrible um, to do. Okay. Um, let's see. The only other thing I can think of to say is um, I didn't see any charts on this on on the software development, but I, I caution you guys not to underestimate what it's going to take to do this. And I don't know if you, do you, do you guys have dedicated people for software? Is it pretty much the people doing the doing the uh, schematics and board layout are also going to be doing the software? So for the lapdog project, at least, um, we have myself and another member are completely devoted to doing uh, software. Um, our primary focus is on the lapdog software. However, uh, once that starts coming down or there's less uh, work, we are going to start branching out and helping out and starting at least the development phase of the software for other boards as needed. So we do have members that are focused on software. OK. Um, I can uh, I can add on to that as well. Uh, actually, even today, I've started onboarding some more uh, CIS students. Uh, so we are planning to put together uh, more software related uh, subgroup of electrical because, uh, like you said, there is a lot of software this year. Um, so we want to make sure that we have enough people for it. Yeah. So what I'd suggest, if you can, is if you've got people who who can start, you know, to start on software, that they should start on it now if they can. I mean, I realize there's probably going to always be last minute changes here and there on, on hardware things, but if, and this, this comes from with experience, but um, when you go to uh, tackle a software project like this, you know, one of the ideas is to try to like put layers of abstraction around things so that you can, they, be, they become independent. You know, it's not, you know, it's not as tight, you know, making it loosely coupled, shall we say. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe or at the very minimum somebody could maybe these folks could develop like test software something that you know when you guys get boards that you can go through and you know ma to make sure everything works you know sequence through give dump raw sensor readings all that kind of stuff um yeah as much as possible we've been getting our hands on some dev kits and trying to standardize yes a lot of our boards to be using these same series of chips we're primarily using stm 32s now that way we, it helps simplify the software development process and gives people a chance to develop some of that earlier than usual Okay. Oh gosh, I almost I almost didn't even need to say anything about that because you guys are already thinking along along those lines. Yeah, there's a lot of work this year on um, starting to get a lot more focus on getting the software under control because it's been one of the weak points of every year. Um, in fact, we've usually ran out of time where the competition was canceled before we even got a chance to do software. Um, and specifically now, um, I'm currently working in the software industry and I'm going to be working full time. So I'm using all the uh, information I'm getting through uh, my internship and soon to be full time job and going to try and pass all that information on before I leave. Oh, no, that, that's excellent. Because even as you're probably finding, even industry has problems with software. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of things I can say. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, so could I. <laughs> okay. Well, gosh, you guys have run me out of questions for the moment. Highly unusual, but okay. All right. All right. I yield the floor yet again. All right, then we'll open it up. Anyone have any questions at all? Uh, any comments? We changed the format this time uh, to, you know, hopefully provide just as much information, sort of consolidated a bit. Uh, any comments on the format from anyone? 